uh, very quick about myself. I'm, uh, as I say, uh, said before, I'm Christian. I'm product owner of security features on the RV platform. So RV was bought by VMware nearly three, three years ago. So it's still the naming is quite difficult uh, sometimes because the official name is NSX Advanced Load Balancer, and that's a really mouthful. So um, we usually stick with the term RV, but if you see anywhere NSX Advanced Load Balancer, that's also um, the same product, okay? Therefore, let's start um, looking at, okay, trying to screen share something here. All right, I think you can see my slides now, very good. So, as I said, I'm happy to keep this interactive. I have put in a couple of uh, question slides just to you know, pause the monologue I'm uh, trying to give you and then uh, give you some options to you know, chime in, um, ask your questions in the chat, and we can talk about that too. But to start with, what do we think of multi-cloud in, uh, in a VMware sense? Right? That, that's kind of the, the first idea I want to bring to your attention. So when we talk about multi-cloud and VMware, we mean that um, wherever we are, wherever the customer is, we meet them and provide a consistent layer 4 to layer 7 uh, application services um, on any app, any cloud, and in with this one platform that we provide with VMware. And uh, on the left side of this slide, you see a lot more different uh, services that we actually can deliver, but we'll focus on the third one, an application firewall today, on application security in general. That's uh, where, where the focus of this session will be. But you can see VMware, when, you, when we talk about multi-cloud, we really mean all of these different uh, cloud solutions where we integrate into and where you can run your application workloads and secure them as well. So then I want to uh, change gears into application security, right? Why is it so important? And what is the, uh, the current impact we are seeing, right? And let me check the poll again. So more than half are actually using an application or a firewall already. So you know what's happening out there, right? You see the attacks coming in um, through uh, uh, to your application every day. And the uh, data that uh, uh, companies like Verizon in their data breach report uh, collect suggests that is only increasing. So um, every week we see more breaches happening and more web applications being the reason for these breaches. And so when you think about it, a web application firewall that is actually uh, one part of your uh, layer uh, def layer defense, right? So you have web application firewall, then you have uh, probably some, some um, defenses on your workload machines as well. So it's a layered uh, idea of defense here. And WAF is really a critical part of that. And it's a security best practice to defend web applications against these attacks. So then, you know, looking at the poll, you're not all using WAFs yet. And we actually um, started as a um, application delivery platform and then moved into uh, adding more services over time. And uh, when we, uh, at the time we, we introduced WAF in, onto our platform, we were asking our customers back then, and uh, you know, what was going on, right? Why aren't WAFs everywhere, right? If it's an integral part of your uh, security defense uh, for web applications, why aren't they deployed everywhere? And the main uh, reason that they're not deployed everywhere that we got was complexity, right? So policy complexity um, that when you look at how WAFs were uh, created over 15 years now, 17 years ago now, um, they started very, very small with a very simple feature set and they grew over the last 17 years quite heavily, adding more and more uh, bits and pieces for um, a standard, which is HTML, which is so diverse and so uh, uh, can be used in so many ways. And then, you know, you can introduce bugs and so on, and therefore security result, uh, vulnerabilities result of that. So fixing all that with a WAF can be a really complex task. And that's why policy complexity was really on the forefront, why WAFs weren't uh, brought into the um, conversation of defending web applications. 
because when you have something complex but and you don't have the people to manage that that gets really really tricky the other thing that uh, we really wanted to um, address was the lack of visibility and here again if you look at traditional application firewalls where uh, the uh, control plane and data plane all resist on one box right and on a box solution um, the visibility features really compete with the data plane so performance features and therefore you have to make a trade of what is uh, what are you focusing on and of course a customer wants performance out of a replication firewall and therefore uh, the visibility was always kind of uh, a second class feature in on our platform we really architected it from the start that visibility and, and analytics is a first class feature and i'll show you that in the demo because this is really one very important thing when i do uh, any of um, you know, uh, bringing WAF onto in front of any application i don't know the application yet so i need the visibility to understand it and to make good decisions to for example tune the policy and i can only do that if i know a lot about it and lastly um the uh, WAFs in the beginning were um were uh, always thought of that they provide very poor performance and scalability and again when you think of a box solution that's true and i'll show you in a minute how the underlying architecture of the rv platform uh, solves that uh, for all the application security needs here as well and going back to your your polls actually right some of you are, uh, answered or uh, you're using a cloud graph so What's the difference here, right? So let's let's uh, uh, bring that in perspective of CloudWave. When they came along um, 10 years ago, they had a different focus. They were actually also trying to solve the complexity problem by focusing on the basics, focusing on providing the ability to block something using signatures um, in a very big way, right? So when you think about a, a DNS-based CloudWave, you can deploy it uh, very quickly through this DNS change, and then all the traffic is uh, scrubbed in the cloud, which is a great thing. But then you are trading security uh, versus uh, the um, the complexity of the policy here. And we wanted to actually aim somewhere in the middle. We wanted to provide more security than a cloud path can offer, and we want, but we also want to reduce the overall complexity of how to. Um, go about implementing an application firewall and hopefully you'll see uh, follow me in the demo there um, that we made good strides in that direction in terms of visibility uh, cloud graph has also some some uh, challenges because when you have um, all these pops around the world and your application uh, is hosted on all these locations you have to actually find a way to centrally show um, all these analytics uh, to a user and that has trade-offs, right? Sometimes the trade-off is that you never get live analytics, right? You always have to wait a couple um, of minutes or, or longer to actually get that information. Or you have to um, make do with only a sample set of, of the data. All of that is possible, but of course it reduces the overall visibility. So Performance-wise, uh, I, I hope uh, no cloud vendor has any problems with that because that's one of the reasons they built uh, their uh, solutions anyway. So uh, uh, can hopefully skip that. So what we set out to do is really uh, build a, a multi-cloud application security solution that can address these uh, things by uh, be doing something different. And what's the difference here? It's really how we build the architecture of um, our RV um product in the first place so when we when you think about it i already mentioned this a little bit you have a separated control and data plane so the uh, controller i'll talk about that uh, today a lot is really the brains of the system and then you have the data plane units which we call service engines which just host the application and the policy and do all the data plane um, processing and with that separation you can actually scale the data plane um, uh, because this is more an application service fabric, right? It scales horizontally uh, and vertically. And what I'll, I'll show you in the demo is that wherever you want to run these uh, service engines, 
we don't care, right? We are multi-cloud. We can run on bare metal in your on-premises. We can, or in a in a private cloud environment, uh, we can run virtualized in containers in public cloud. All of that is possible because one controller just talks to or can talk to all of these different environments and uh, manage the environment if possible, and uh, then also um, provide application services by using these service engines. And the controller is a central place of orchestration. So um, you'll see me in the demo use, uh, for example, our Python SDK to uh, use our API to set up some of the demo environments. Um, the controller is always your central place there because it's a REST API first product. Uh, you can use it not just with um, a Python SDK, but you can do Ansible, Terraform, and so on as well. The elasticity, uh, as I mentioned, we have the ability to scale horizontally and vertically um, if you add more cores to a single service engine or add more service engines, that's also possible to give more um, resources to provide, uh, to provide a better user experience and to also run, for example, application security features like the web application firewall. Um, resilience is a big topic for us as well. So the controller takes care of that, right? If the um, service engine would go down or the uh, connection to that part of the cloud would fail, the um, controller automatically uh, recognizes that and moves the application traffic, the virtual services to a different service engine and therefore automatically resolve the um, problem of uh, something is down and can also uh, then talk to the underlying infrastructure to fire up a new service engine, right? If uh, the service engine for whatever reason went down, um, the um, controller will talk to the cloud uh, and, and uh, fire up a new one. I touched automation a little bit. This is uh, really dear to my heart um, to make you aware that um, automating, of course, the infrastructure seems logical, right? You do that, but we can automate also the security features on top of the platform as well. So we have customers running full CI/CD automation, bringing their um, applications online through the RV platform, but also bringing online their replication firewall, their IP reputation, the bot management, all of that together um, using just their pipeline and actually keeping the configuration with the application because one of the uh, really important things to remember for us is that all our configuration can be accessed via uh, a, an API call. So there's no hidden configuration here, right? So we, we, everything's out in the open and you can just uh, store, if you wanted to, your configuration with your application version in Git, for example. The, one of the focuses which I mentioned before was analytics and observability. So all of these service engines send their data to the controller and then the controller has enough um, uh, performance, again, to provide uh, full-blown analytics to what's going on. Um, on an uh, application layer um, and uh, even on a network layer for when the traffic comes in, but also analytics of how is the uh, security posture of the application and maybe you want to tune uh, the policy, the WAF policy, and you can do that too by having advanced analytics here. And the last, th last thing I want to mention is we have actually RV cloud services where the controller connects to. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth because it's really um, when you're uh, offering security services today, you need to be um, as fast as uh, the uh, as the attackers out there. So you need to uh, be able to update constantly, for example, your IP reputation database. And that's uh, done via the RV cloud service. So Christian, and there is... There is a question in the question box. Mm -hmm. um, you can just have a look at that. And if you would, wouldn't mind just reading out the question as well. Yeah, sure. OK, so I'm seeing a uh, question here by need. Thank you for that question. So um, we have a, a, Terraform, a Terraform provider. So you can run all of this uh, using Terraform. Actually, if you go. Um, into uh, our webinar sections on the uh, on the rvnetworks.com, you'll find webinars talking about only automation using Terraform. 
So then, Ratan, thank you for the next question. Is Avivath APRA compliant? So now I'm I'm a little bit lost about what APRA is. Um, the uh, perhaps what perhaps I'm, perhaps one of the local guys can answer that because like guy or someone because that's a local financial services regulation, which Christian you will not know about. <laughs> <laughs> no. so, so perhaps guy can no. answer that or, or Isha. Yeah, I don't know if it's been evaluated against the uh, APRA compliance, but I can, I can, uh, I'll do some research while we're uh, while we're doing this webinar. Okay, and there's another ask here: Can it adapt to new threats without interrupting service? So, uh, one of the uh, underlying foundations of the RB platform is that we never interrupt service when you do a policy change. So. It will keep the old connections open, and all, uh, all the new connections will uh, go into the new policy. And it will drain the old ones and then move completely to the new policy uh, in place. So when you do a policy update, there is no service interruption at all. OK, so thank you for the uh, first round of questions. Hey, Christian, the, um, I've got a, I've, yep. I'm going to pull rank here just for a moment. Um, because I've got a speaker and a microphone, right? So, um, do you have do you have a Pulumi provider at all to be able to automate using Pulumi? Sorry, I'm I'm not following the question. Uh, so, Pulumi is an automation framework. Um, okay. And no. I'm just no. Okay, because uh, it's so I, I'm I'm not aware of it, but uh, again, let's give it to Guy and and he can give you the research there. The all the major frameworks uh, I'm aware of, but that one I, I'm not aware. Of. Okay, no, it's I'm just asking because I'm seeing a lot more interest locally in Halumi. That's all. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll chase it up with Guy. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so, all right, we got these questions answered. So I want to now, again, we, we focused on the very high level in the beginning, right? Multi-cloud application services. Then we moved into what's the RV platform. And now we are looking at the security features. So we are, again, closing in on our actual subject, subject here. On our RV platform, we provide a lot of security functionality. And I want to just give you the overview here. So if you're, we're talking about attack types like the classic web traffic, API or app traffic, file uploads, or um, if you look at different actors, human versus bots, uh, we can address all of that using our app security functionalities. And what I mentioned already quite a lot is, of course, the web application firewall, which is the foundation for a lot of these protections when it comes to input validation. And then we do the input validation and it goes to the application file, uh, to the application in the backend. The web application firewall and many of the other services that we provide needs um, some updates for our RV Cloud Threat Intelligence feeds. And that's really the, where the signatures get updated. And um, you know, I mentioned IP reputation already. Another piece of the puzzle for us is really malware protection. So if you are thinking about uh, your hosting and web application, and you have uploads that you know uh, are then uh, transferred to some storage, and you know maybe somebody in your company has to look at those uploads. Like I don't know, a CV upload if you're running a job portal. Then a malware protection is an interesting topic for you, because we've we've all seen the the news where you know uh, some upload contained a macro or contained malicious. Uh, data that then got executed and so it spread uh, in the companies um, using that method. So with RV you can uh, use ICAP, which is a, um, a protocol for sending um, files back and forth to actually send an upload to an ICAP server, which then, then does the uh, checking for you and provides RV with a response. So ICAP servers that we support currently are OpsWord and Lastline, and we have a generic ICAP um, client as well, which uh, supports other ICAP servers. 
On the platform, as I said, security visibility is really, really dear to my heart because it gives you the uh, ideas of what's going on, how, uh, what kind of attacks are coming in, and are these attacks um, blocked, and what can you do to improve your security posture. And uh, the uh, last piece of the puzzle is uh, what we have uh, uh, coined bot management here, where we really uh, take a stride and is the uh, incoming uh, client is that considered a human or is it really just an automated program um, which we would call bot and uh, if it's if you think it's a bot then we uh, try to uh, classify it as maybe a good bot if it comes from google it has the right ip addresses uh, if it claims to be google but doesn't have the right ip addresses we would uh, give it an impersonator um, classification and you know all of that is is needed because uh, so much of the traffic coming in is automated traffic and the ability to actually handle this and uh, maybe to rate limits or uh, uh, create custom bot profiles that again then can be handled differently is really important yeah and uh, last item on on this slide is really we uh, achieved the icsa certification last year which is a third party uh, validation for uh, web application firewalls um, if you uh, go to icsalabs.com and uh, search for their um, catalog there, you'll, you'll see that um, the uh, VMware NSX Advanced Load Balancer WAF, so again, it's a really mouthful, um, is certified as uh, application firewall. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to touch base on a couple more things in terms of the live, live thread feeds, because this is really always an important topic um, first, I want to uh, tell you that all of our um, thread feeds are opt-in. So by default, it's all uh, not enabled because uh, as a security guy, I think the customer needs to get the option to say no if they or to leave it and no if they don't want it. Um, or if, if you don't use the IP reputation feature, then uh, you don't need to download these um, immediately. So, um, and that's really the, the key here, right? So we have IP reputation, GeoDB bot uh, detection updates, application rules and signatures that get updated uh, through the uh, cloud connection or centrally through the controller. So the controller, again, has to register with uh, the cloud services. And then all of these can be enabled and additional functionality as well, right? So there's also central licensing, there's um, uh, case management for support cases, all of that is there, um, but I'm focusing on the uh, security bits and pieces. Um, one thing that I always get asked, what's the um, uptake for here? What do you need to pay to actually get this? Um, the base license, um, when you uh, uh, get a core license for the other platform, includes all of this IP reputation, bot, and so on. Um, it's all in one license. So we encourage everybody to use it because you're already paying for it anyway. Okay, so um, yeah, I uh, also wanted to highlight again the malware protection. Um, the way this works is uh, if you uh, look a little bit more in depth into this, that really we define um, the file upload uh, paths or file upload types, and then we pause the request, send it uh, or stream it to the ICAP server, and here the ICAP server then does the checking. That can be a, a pure a check on, uh, yes, uh, this is okay, and it's not okay, but we also support uh, modifications. So if the uh, ICAP server supports that, right, sanitization, for example, of, a, uh, of a, an Excel file to, by removing the macro, we support that we can take the um, response from the ICAP server and send it to the application fully sanitized. So that's also possible. OK, so that was the second part, right? We looked at um, the overall application security um, feature set on the platform. Now I want to dive into the WAF specifically. Um, any questions before I go to that one? Okay. No, I think we're good, man. Okay, great. Then 
Let's move into the application uh, firewall. I am again giving you the high level view first and then we zoom in. So as a WAF uh, pipeline, what we've built here is really a combination of allow list, positive security and signatures. And uh, the three of uh, the three parts here provide the full uh, layer of WAF protection for, for you guys. So um, when we look at each individual item, uh, you'll see that they all benefit from the uh, log analytics, which um, uh, I'll show you in the demo later. And um, all these logs can be sent to a central SIM, um, of course, if you want to run your own analytics on it, on it as well. So if we look into the allow list, the allow list is really your place where you want to um, address the, the fact that some of your traffic doesn't need to go through WAF or shouldn't go through WAF. So the uh, way here is you define a, a part of your application where you can uh, bypass the request or do traffic sampling. Um, an example for the bypass is if you have gigabytes of uploads, um, you would like uh, probably would like to bypass them from WAF, but rather do them uh, do check them in the ICAP, which I mentioned before, right in the malware protection, because uh, the WAF would need to buffer this and run signatures on it. But on, I don't know, a gigabyte of a video file, you probably only get a couple of false positives, but not, not much else out of such an effort. So it doesn't make sense. So bypassing a big upload makes a lot of uh, sense from a WAF perspective. Um, or if you're running vulnerability scans, you want to um, um, actually scan the actual application and not the protection by the application firewall, you can do that too using the allow list. Um, other examples would be, as I mentioned, you can do traffic sampling. So you can do a canary deployment of your WAF, right? We are not comfortable yet, but you can send 10% of the traffic to the WAF and see how um, the WAF policy and, and the application traffic work together. Or you could exclude path from enforcement uh, mode, which is one of the two modes the WAF can run in. We have detection and enforcement, where detection only uh, logs requests um, that um, uh, does not, do not comply with the WAF policy, but enforcement would actually block those um, requests. And once it uh, finishes that stage, uh, we go to the positive security and application learning section. And this is really um, what most of our, our customers are uh, implementing these days because it uh, makes their life um, running an application firewall uh, a lot easier. And um, the way we've built it is uh, different from traditional um, learning engines. Um, and let me try to find, uh, give you an idea of why that is. So um, the general idea of, of any learning engine for an application firewall is build a model of the application. And um, in that sense, we are doing a very similar approach here. We are taking application traffic, feed it into the learning engine, and creating uh, a model out of this for application uh, rules or positive security rules that then protect the application with the known application behavior. First of all, that's a good idea uh, to do that because it actually tailors the application um, policy, Hello. the web WAF policy to your application. So uh, that's a really good first step. Yeah. I'm, so what is the difference here? Um, when you look at traditional learning engines, uh, okay. I mentioned it before, it was competing uh, between the uh, data plane and the uh, uh, the uh, control plane, right? It was, uh, we had on the same box competing interests. With the separation of the uh, controller, we have the ability to send that data to the control plane, run the learning uh, uh, processes there, and uh, we don't compete with the data plane performance. So it doesn't impact that at all. We also build it in a way that it tunes itself. So uh, because you ha might have applications that get updated every day, or even quicker than that, or you have applications that get up, uh, updated every month or never. In all the of three cases, we got you covered because the learning engine uses um, uh, a similar algorithms to tune itself, right? If no new data comes in, right, the entropy of the incoming data is actually really low, then we don't need to learn 
anymore, right? You might already learn everything that there is. Then it auto tunes itself, it uh, lowers the sampling rate, and therefore um, takes very little resources on the controller and waits for new traffic uh, to come in. And therefore, you don't need to disable it, right? There's no need to think about it after you enable this if you ever need to disable it again because it just waits for new traffic. Yeah, and, and uh, positive security is really a good way to um, provide protection for your application. You can also use um, something like uh, virtual patching where we take an input from a maybe a quality scan and uh, create rules out of this, or you can uh, create manual policy rules as well. And sometimes that's a good idea if you uh, have a certain part of your application which triggers a lot of false positives and you don't want to you know, take into the complexity of uh, uh, creating exclusions for each individual rule, then a uh, um, positive security rule is much better of an idea uh, to do this and uh, very quickly done as well. The uh, um, An example for that is um, we have seen at customers that they have very um, application specific but uh, encrypted uh, cookies, right? Uh, or uh, sometimes even the SAML cookie, right? That's an encrypted long cookie with a lot of different um, uh, potential false positives in there. And we see that happening. So uh, why not create a, a, a positive security rule for the SAML uh, cookie then and get rid of all the uh, problems with that? Okay, and the last part of the puzzle, um, Chris, I get to your, uh, to your question in a, in a second. So the last part of the puzzle is really the application um, uh, signatures, right? So, um, and here we have two types. We have the application rules and the core rule set, and they have different focuses. So the application rules are more your um, exploit-specific, application-specific rules. So there are over 15,000 uh, rules in there with 5,000 plus applications. And I think there was a question about how do we handle zero days? One of the ways to handle zero days is using application rules. So if you um, have, for example, the uh, spring zero day from a little bit over a month ago, there's an application rule for that. So if you're running spring um, applications or use the framework, then you can uh, protect yourself with the application rules. And those get updated, uh, get updated automatically daily. On the other hand, you have the core rule set, which is the much broader um, set of rules that you are know, used to probably for most of the um, application firewalls out there, right? Signatures to find your common web attacks and protect you against cross-site scripting, SQL injection, all, all of that stuff. And yeah, it's really a, a good combination if, depending on what kind of applications you have, right? If you are uh, running off the shelf applications or using of the shelf uh, frameworks, then application rules can help you. But if you are completely writing your own application, then the core rule set is your um, first line of defense here. And how does it work together? Um, this unvalidated traffic first hits the allow list. Um, if you have to find anything that is known good, um, it will be passed to the application. The rest goes to positive security. Positive security with uh, the learning and has done. Uh, has a model of the application, um, probably not a complete model, but a, a model of uh, the parts of the application that it has learned so far. And then it validates it here again. Um, you can actually reject as well. So if, if it doesn't comply with the application model, it can reject. Um, but you also can send it to the signatures depending on your uh, security posture that you want to uh, deploy. And yeah, last part of the puzzle is really the signatures which do the final checking and then the rest of the traffic is sent to the application. So, and why does it, why is this a good idea? Because uh, your signatures are the most common source for false positive. So if you see we're reducing the overall traffic that goes through the signatures by having positive security rules that get automatically learned and therefore the overall false positive rate that you uh, will see is reduced. It's also more performant and scalable uh, running less signatures because looking at a signature, it's probably that, that amount of text, right? And, and re gigantic regular expressions because they have to be really, really broad to cover all these different attack types and cover all the different um, uh, tries of the attackers to 
uh, bypass them. On the contrary, a positive security rule uh, that defines your application is very, very simple. So uh, I'll give you an example here. If you're um, looking at, for example, a database ID, it just says this is the database ID and this is uh, the uh, regular expression, which basically says this is a number of the length of 20 and that's it. Right. And instead of running hundreds of signatures on the same input, you're running uh, one signature that very quickly, uh, very um, uh, much defines how this uh, input should uh, look like. And that makes it a lot faster as well. So, and before we go into the questions, uh, some uh, overview of the analytics we provide. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, analytics is one of the uh, major strengths of the Hubble platform. So first of all, you get real end-to-end -end timing of what's going on for every request coming in. You see where, what part of the request might have been slow. Was it the application response? Was it actually the round trip to the client? You can easily see that. You get DDoS metrics. So if uh, um, we haven't talked about this yet, but this is uh, a system has a um, um, functionality which continuously looks for um, DDoS attack types and uh, we cover over 30 of those and they're all mentioned on our KB page. So when these happen, you get DDoS metrics as well. You get full app log analytics of how what, uh, what's going on in terms of your request, what was the significance, why it was flagged, for example, why it got blocked, all of that is there for you to investigate. Um, then you have specific WAF attack analytics where um, you can see exactly what happened. You can triage um, how your application works with the, uh, with the WAF policy and really um, get into the details there. And another one you get is SSL metrics because SSL is part of the uh, if your security stack as well. So you might want to see what kind of TLS versions are coming in. Okay, and this really allow, uh, gives you all the tools to be fast and precise of how to identify um, any security issues on your uh, on your platform and secure them and you know, kind of do this uh, tuning cycle. Okay, uh, some more questions before we jump into the demo. Um, we have any, so the, uh, the uh, uh, for if you have an offline application, right, you cannot, you don't have internet access, you can do a couple things. Um, first of all, the uh, uh, the uh, core rule set is something you can actually um, download from our uh, customer portal and uh, upload to the controller manually if you are disconnected. So that that's uh, your first step. The other one is, for example, if you want to build something or use something like um, IP reputation, um, you can could do an offline transfer of that uh, as well and upload it via API to uh, our product. Um, much else will not work, right? So because uh, we're continuously updating things like the bot uh, detection will not work without uh, internet access um, to continuously update the uh, data we need to make a good uh, bot or human decision. So uh, can you show us how to create a custom policy and a custom workbook profile? Okay, sure, I can show you that. And with that, um, let me remember how to stop sharing and go into a different. So I've got a, I've got a quick question just while you're doing that, Christian. Um, mm -hmm. Can you describe or even show how you would do A-B testing between different rule sets? Because I might have a new rule set that I only want to go to a portion before I roll it out. Um, yeah, so uh, this right? is... Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I can't, I don't have a setup here that can show you this uh, quickly, but you can certainly do this in RV because you have all the different options of um, using the different uh, different policies and, and uh, manage this with our advanced virtual hosting concept where you have one a virtual service that has the central where all traffic comes in and then you can branch out and do, use different policies uh, to test them out so uh, uh, many options to do this uh, again i would refer to a an automation um, presentation where they cover this in depth 
Okay. Yeah, so cool. Thank you. one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, things that because we're talking about running this in multiple clouds, right? So here my demo system has actually five co uh, controllers and they are all distributed and they talk to different backends. So if we go to um, the admin tenant for, for a second and actually looking at the cloud resources we have here, um, you can see that we have multiple clouds that we address. So here we are talking to AWS, Azure, and a VMware vSphere cloud. All of this is managed to five controllers, but they are all um, they're talking to these infrastructure services to create the virtual services. And you can assign those, um, of course, to where you want to run them. So yeah, here, the, the clouds overview kind of give you the, the, the idea. And, and all you need to do is really um, connect your uh, AWS account, and then it can uh, fire up service engines there. So and Something else I, I haven't really touched on is multi-tenancy. So for, in our demo systems, we have many tenants that can do different things. In uh, my case here, I, I want to use the demo tenant and the positive security demo ten, uh, tenant as well. Because what I did before the uh, start of this presentation, I actually ran uh, some automation scripts. And I use uh, Jupyter Notebook for this um, because I like Python. So uh, Python in the browser is really what I like to do. And I'm connecting to the uh, uh, system. Uh, here's here's a good overview, and I can actually orchestrate my demo. I can uh, do REST API calls to my attack or spider traffic, uh, uh, simulate attacks. I can talk to Avi to um, you know set up the system uh, all automatically to get this this hackers on. And the next step is I actually want to run uh, the automatic learning um, on uh, in, in this uh, automation tool as well, which I'll show you in. Uh, in a second, because then um, we have a follow through when I showed you how the configuration works. So, if you have a new virtual service, you know it just got uh, some initial traffic. Um, you'll uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you actually on the demo system um, on the on the other demo tenant here because we have continue continuously traffic here. So, uh, show, giving you an idea what uh, is my end to end timing look like, right? What is my throughput? Requests per second, uh, or my my how many bots I'm identifying, and in that regard, when you hit the edit button, you can then uh, review your configuration here. Uh, as you can see, uh, we assigned a RAF policy, which um, is the, the way of enabling the application firewall, and we also have the bot detection enabled. So uh, two things that. Um, uh, are part of our application security solution. And if I go into the buff policy here, you'll see that configuration works very similarly to uh, what you had seen on the slides in the pipeline. So we, we can configure our learning, which is not enabled here. We have a loudest positive security application rules. And the last one is then the signatures. So all of that uh, provides the uh, security functionality, and in our in our uh, other application here, let me quickly run this uh, by you because we have more more rights in in my application. You'll see that learning is disabled and positive security doesn't exist yet. Um, to do some learning, what I'm I'm firing up here is just a uh, creating uh, using two uh, API calls to enable the learning. And now I'm spidering. I'm creating lots and lots of traffic because um, learning an application doesn't work without having a good amount of traffic. So going back here, reloading this, uh, this view. OK, interesting. Now learning is enabled. We have a 100% sampling rate, and we learn with very high confidence. I have to tweak this a little so the uh, the learning interval is really low, so we actually see something right in the short amount of time we have for the presentation. So one minute wouldn't be your default; um, it would be thirty minutes. So we gather more data over time. Yeah, in positive security, we also have a, a learning group now, which is uh, currently empty, and over time. While I'm going to present a little bit about the application firewall, it, this will fill up with data 
um, with rules that it has learned from the traffic that we're sending to it. Okay. So um, there was a question about a policy and a profile. And we have actually these two concepts in the application firewall uh, config because we have a profile, which is here a hackathon profile for me, um, which contains a lot of information about the um, HTTP uh, strictness, right? So we let's say which versions of HTTP allowed which methods, are there any restricted extensions um, or static extensions that we want to address, then what are the default actions, what is our content type mapping? So these are relatively generic things which uh, we encourage to reuse them, right? So if you have, for example, many applications that use a similar uh, PHP stack or a .NET stack or uh, something like that Java stack, then uh, it might make sense to have a profile for them that you can easily reuse. But then the policy is more on a, a application specific where you learn the de details about that application, create this policy and really um, uh, you, you get into the details there. And just in the interest of time, let me reload this to see if we already have some some data that got learned from the application. Yeah, so the first data is coming in. So again, I'm spy doing, I'm sending lots and lots of traffic. It has actually seen slash product view with enough data. And here we have an ID parameter where it says, okay, this is a maximum, uh, it's in the, in the um, value of digits and the maximum value length of 16. And so over time with more and more traffic, it creates this application um, model and really can enforce this model as well. Here, um, I'm actually enforcing it with a block, but you could set this to no operation, then it would uh, not enforce a miss here, and it would also use the uh, signatures for additional checking of that. Okay, you've um, seen the basic configuration here, and we have um, other um, um, uh, webinars that talk about how to configure this in more detail as well. I only wanted to highlight the detail of information that you get out of the system, right? the analytics problem. So if you have a request, um, you get a lot of lots of information of what happened here in terms of uh, the actual data. You get, maybe oh, let me change to the other, the other environment. So we have more, even more data. So log analytics, give you really uh, insights into what's going on. Come on. Okay, it won't load. Ah, no, 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 here we have it. So um, for example, here we have a rejected request. Um, this gives you all the information about the request itself. Um, the bot management actually said this is a human. And from a WAF perspective, um, you can see this is uh, somebody trying to do a SQL injection attack. So lots of things are happening here um, that help you to make uh, decisions on how to tune the policy. Because again, something which we haven't discussed yet is our recommendation system. So if I wanted to um, allow this request in the future, you can use the recommendation system to tweak the policy. Here, it would actually recommend an exclusion to uh, this ID parameter on this rule that uh, blo uh, blocked the request before. Obviously, we have seen this, this is an attack, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to accept this recommendation here in, in a demo system. But this really helps you to bring uh, the WAF online really, really quickly. And the last thing I want to show you is the WAF analytics page, where you again get an overview of all the things that happen with your application firewall config in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, uh, interactions with the WAF policy. So and and so much for for the demo. I'll want to go back to a couple points on on the uh, slide deck before we close. So it's really important to understand that you have a, uh, with Avi, you get a central management plane. You can um, re either run your own controllers or you can use our SAS controllers where we run uh, the controller for you and then connect to these different ecosystems and really manage 
um, from the central control plane. Um, by having a central uh, control plane and creating maybe um, a company default policies, you can do that using the uh, um, one uh, system of controllers as well by having this as a requirement. And I hope I could show you that the, the system actually offers you comprehensive wrath protection, it offers you bot management, it offers you IP reputation, um, and a lot more, which we uh, didn't have time to cover today uh, in one uh, platform and gives you all this visibility uh, right there in your controller as well. And something to consider when you when you think about adapting uh, such a system is really um, if you are using a RAF cloud uh, protection today, um, that can be limiting in some cases, right? RAF, uh, cloud RAFs do not do um, positive security, for example, right? So um, there's a, a difference uh, there. Um, if you want to avoid that, you could look at a, a solution like uh, the RV platform to provide you more in a similar fashion. Um, and of course, if you want to use multiple uh, cloud services, uh, multiple hyperscalers, then um, an RV solution can help you uh, bridge that gap as well. Yeah, and this is really what, where we wanted to go today. Uh, my uh, goal was to show you how to enable application firewall, give you all the visibility on one uh, platform uh, as well. So there are some next steps here just for the recording. You can go to our webinars. You can try um, I, uh, the uh, solution. We have hands-on labs where you can fire up 90 minutes of, um, uh, uh, of a uh, hands-on lab to try maybe the whole WAF demo that I just showed you. Or you can join one of our workshops to learn more. And now. Um, yeah, we are nearly out of time, but I hope we can answer some, some of the questions. So I'm reading it here. If, if I detect, so Andrew asks, if I detect bots in one tenant, can I block them for all tenants easily? So the, uh, the, uh, the way the bot detection works is that um, it will uh, flag the uh, what det uh, also yeah, yeah, uh, the detection is independent from the actions. So um, the detection works across the platform. So uh, it just you know, uses similar detection techniques in any of your virtual services. And you can then decide on um, each of the tenants how you want to handle this. Um, I see it also does GSLB. Will it also block in a different region if it detects a or somewhere else. So the uh, the way this uh, works is that the uh, uh, GSLB uh, does not necessarily uh, transfer data of an identified bot uh, somewhere else uh, by uh, as a feature. The uh, beauty of our platform is though, if you uh, uh, you can fully automate this uh, using. Um, control scripts, which are um, Python-based automations on the controller, and then external automation as well, right? So if you um, uh, uh, spend a little bit time of setting this up, you could actually easily uh, create something like that uh, for your individual use case, um, where you query, you know, what are the bots in these, and then um, push the uh, the updates um, to the GSLB endpoints. Okay, so any other questions, guys? Yeah, I've got one. I've got another one, Christian, hard one. Um, okay. How do you determine if the uh, endpoint is, a, or the caller is a human or not? Is that done um, in the browser of, like in my browser? Do you download JavaScript or is it done some other way or is it a combination? Can you talk about so that a little bit? Uh, sure. So uh, I, w I just want to highlight there's uh, a, a five-minute how-to video on YouTube about this uh, for everybody who, who wants to dive in more, in more depth. The uh, um, short answer is uh, bot management is relatively new for us. So we, are, we have roadmap items for um, doing JavaScript execution. Um, but currently what we are uh, doing is looking at individual items of the request. Um, so uh, starting with very simple user agent, then of course the IP address, then uh, the location of that IP address, 
doing combinations of that um, very quickly in the, in the summer release we will do TLS fingerprinting as one of the next steps to enhance the bot um, uh, detection and to be fair bot detection is always a uh, race right so we are racing with the attackers um, and to, to you know, do better detection to uh, their, uh, them trying to circumvent it. So this is an ongoing feature like the web application firewall, which every new uh, version we bring out will have enhanced detection capabilities. Okay, yeah, cool. An another, There's another question. Integrate with uh, Splunk. Yes, you can uh, send uh, the uh, log. Uh, logs that we create centrally to Splunk. We have a Splunk app for the, for you to start off here, um, but you can use any other uh, tool that uh, can ingest syslog and then uh, you know uh, look at that data uh, in your own analytics tools. Okay, 